Hey, and welcome to Better Utah Broadcast. Uh, my name is Katie Matheson. I'm the Communications Director here at Alliance for a Better Utah. And today we have Felicia Maxfield Barrett from uh, Utah Council for Utah uh, Citizen Diplomacy. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming. Uh, let's double check right real quick. Let's make sure perfect. There we are. All right, so um, of course, every Wednesday at 12.30, you can join us live. We're gonna be speaking with movers and shakers in Utah, um, and be sure to click Get Reminders so that you can get reminders when we're about to go live. But before we begin, we're going to play a game, and audience, I'm going to let you know we've played this game, and we had a little bit of tech difficulties, so we're gonna play again. I'm giving all new headlines. Oh, to okay. Felicia. Okay, yeah, you don't have to pretend this okay. time. All right, so the game is, is this real life? And for those of you who haven't joined us before, the way it goes is we put together some real headlines that are outrageous and some fake headlines, and then Felicia has to guess which ones are real and which ones are fake, okay? okay. Um, all right, so the first one is, let's see. <coughs> Riders say Uber drivers are using vomit to scam them. To scam them? Oh, okay. Um, I'm gonna say true. Yes! <laughs> I want to read that. Very good. Okay, that one will be in the comments. Great, great. All right, next one. Scuba divers in New Zealand find pieces of wreckage that scientists believe used to belong to the Titanic. I would say true. False. Oh. But I mean, you never know. Like, yeah. It's right. always exciting whenever you find wreckage and you're like, oh, this ship was, you know, millions yeah. of years old. Well, I also the Titanic. Anyway. <laughs> All right, good job. Okay, next one. Barry, the amazing water dog, has broken the open water swimming record in Manchester, UK, upsetting the previous record holder, Spike Jr., from Australia. I'm gonna say true. That is false. Oh. I mean, like, that we know of. Like, it could have happened. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody covered it. All right. Um, okay, a little bit morbid, but we're gonna go with it. Psychic octopus that predicted World Cup matches has been killed for food. I'm gonna say true. Yes. Oh no. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that one is true. Okay. I'm gonna need to process that one. Yeah, because octopi are like incredibly intelligent. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, clearly. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> All right. Woman says Neil Armstrong gave her a vial of moon dust. Sues NASA to keep it. True. Yes. Really. She preemptively sued. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. She wanted to make sure she could keep it. Wow. All right. Let's do a final one. Okay. Hmm. MIT robotics team creates two AIs that can quantify love. I'm gonna say true. False as of uh, this moment. Um, but I mean, you never know. Right? You know, AI is all over the place. Right? All right. A second ago, they could have figured it out. Right, right. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, and then we will, like, be, you know, we will have predicted that and then everybody will love us. All right. <laughs> All right, so let's get into it. Let's talk about um, your background first. So talk, can you talk to us about your education, uh, your personal story, and kind of where your passion for diplomacy came from? Yeah, yeah, so, um, you know, my background's pretty pretty standard. I'm native to Utah. I was born and raised in American Fork. Um, you know, the schools I went to was Cedar City for a year, so then Utah University, and then it, back in the day, it was Utah Valley State. Utah Valley State College, and then they changed it to Utah Valley University. Um, and then I eventually made my way up to the University of Utah where I got my undergrad in um, anthropology with an emphasis in ethnography because I really am an advocate for storytelling. I think there's a lot of data that we can get from storytelling. Um, and then I wanted to figure out a way that I could use an anthropological degree here in Utah and not have to move halfway around the world, as well as my husband at the time. Um, he was not a big fan of having to up and relocate and live in a rainforest or something like that. Um, and so I did some research and figured out that we have this really significant refugee population here in, in Utah. And at the time, I was working for the Department of Workforce Services, and they were starting a specialty team that was focusing on refugees in getting them set up with food stamps and Medicaid and childcare and, and TANF benefits. 
Um, and so I just applied and I got to be on the team and you know be became the supervisor of the team and and we quickly expanded from just serving refugees to serving all hard to serve populations here in Utah so that included um, people who were um, living in addiction recovery centers and domestic violence shelters and um, some of the reservations some of the polygamous colonies or communities here um, and and I but my passion was serving the refugee population and so then I moved over to the refugee services office in the state of Utah and at the time decided to go back to school and get my master's in public administration up at the University of Utah um, and thought government was where I wanted to be. I was really fascinated by this idea of um, public policy and bureaucracy. But then as I started taking classes and doing some more volunteer work with nonprofits, I quickly changed my mind and realized that grassroots advocacy really takes place in the nonprofit sector. And so I switched my emphasis over to nonprofits. Um, I became the director of a nonprofit called the Utah Refugee Coalition, and now I believe that they're called The Connection. Um, and I just loved it. And I did, you know, between the government work and the nonprofit work, to work with refugees for about 10 years. And then I just needed a change. It had been long enough that I, I just sort of needed to figure out where I was going. And so then I went to go work for this really great nonprofit called Wasatch Community Gardens. Um, as doing their communications and their volunteer coordination. And then it was probably three years after that, a colleague of mine came to me, and she was the director of the um, Utah Council for Citizen Diplomacy, and said, hey, I need a communications person to come over here. I know you like the international community. I know you like storytelling, so come and work for me. And I said, yeah, I think that sounds great. And so I did some research about the council and, and just really felt like they were a solid, ethical, transparent nonprofit. And so I came over. Um, and then it was about a, six months into my job that my colleague and the director said, oh, I'm moving to Germany. And she opened up her position as executive director. So then I applied and went through the process and was selected to fill this role. And I love it. It's, it's really, really great. And I think, you know, my passion of diplomacy really, it, it touches into all of the jobs that I've done. And it's this idea of rad subtle but radical grassroots movements that you can do to change the system. It doesn't have to, you know, there's very few people that are just have this get of, on a large scale being radical organizers to change the system but really change happens on the most subtle level you know so what is more powerful and radical with a refugee community than to share my resources and my knowledge of my local community to help them succeed when they come into Utah which is a new process altogether um, and just be a friend you know, with Wasatch Community Gardens, what is more radical than growing your own food and being, you know, removing yourself from this food system that has been created in our society? And then in terms of public diplomacy or citizen diplomacy, what is more radical in an environment where we're supposed to be America first? Um, so I just really like that subtle, radical, grassroots movements, um, you know, and that, that's why I do the work that I do. It sounds like it's really, um, like, local community-based, mm -hmm. like, just change, small changes in your own community right, right. that can impact, you know, that can reverberate throughout, um, like, everybody that you talk to and that you come to connection with. Oh, absolutely. I'm a big believer in the ripple effect. You know, I think it starts here, and as much as I would love to end world hunger and, and you know, make sure everybody has enough food, you know, within my capacity, with a, what I'm able to reasonably do, you know, I want to make sure that my community is, is taken care of, and then hopefully through my actions, that ripple effect will, will happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about UCCD? Is that, you guys call it UCCD? We have that, yeah, we have, that's the short term, just because Utah Council for Citizen Diplomacy, mm -hmm. and we, we recently changed our name. It was probably around the early 2000s, we were originally known as the International Visitors Utah Council, and you say that to people and they're like, what? 
I just did that, that right? Yeah. <laughs> right. So Utah Council for Citizen Diplomacy, or UCCD. Um, yeah. So we're a nonprofit organization. We're nonpartisan. Um, it, we've been around for 50 years. We got our start in 1967. Um, with this woman, Taza Armstrong Pierce, who really just had this love and passion to connect Utah to the rest of the world. Um, you know, recognizing that a lot of people didn't have the opportunity to go and travel abroad and experience different cultures and communities that way, she really focused on bringing the globe to Utah. Um, and that's what we've been doing for 50 years, is just promoting respect and understanding between the people of Utah and other nations, um, as simple as one handshake at a, at a time. Everybody, regardless of who you are, have a right and a responsibility to help shape foreign relations that one handshake at a time. Um, and yeah, so, so over the 50 years, we estimate that we've brought in about 10,000 international people from around the world, um, about, 100, about 200 countries to Utah to do short-term professional and cultural exchanges. Wow. Yeah, so, so quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, that's a huge undertaking. Yeah. Good job for you guys. Thanks. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> um, so can you kind of tell me, what is citizen diplomacy? Because I think when I think of diplomacy, I'm like, oh, it needs to be in an embassy, and I need to have a degree, and I need to be appointed. But what is citizen diplomacy look like? Yeah, so we, we very much rely on that traditional diplomacy, you know, our official ambassadors and embassies throughout the world to, to take on the big foreign relation issues, you know, and we've seen some really great examples of diplomacy taking place this year, for better or for worse, mm -hmm. um, however you want to define it. Um, I think when you get people in a room together to talk and say, how do we make um, the world more equally connected, um, more accessible to opportunities, I, you know, I always think that open dialogue is always a great starting point. Um, but in terms of citizen diplomacy, you know, I like that concept just because that brings the control back into a local level. Um, so for us, the way that we exercise citizen diplomacy is we bring in these international visiting groups and they can be from a single country, they can be from a region, they can be from around the world. Um, to meet with like-minded professionals to do an exchange of best practices and resources and knowledge. Um, you know, so an example is today we're welcoming in a group from Belarus who's here to learn about digital theater. And so they're going to go up to the um, Utah State University and take a look at their theater department. And then there is also an opera festival that's taking place, so they're going to um, participate by attending one of their productions. They're going to come here on Friday and um, tour the Capitol Theater and the Eccles Theater. Um, and, and then talk to a couple of nonprofits and a couple of elected officials about how is the state of Utah supporting theater um, as an educational and a community tool. And just share those resources and best practices. And then also while they're here, they'll engage in cultural activities. So a lot of times we suggest, you know, we'll go visit Park City because of the Olympic park up there. Um, Antelope Island is really a great opportunity to go see the Great Salt Lake. That's really what we're known for. Um, a lot of times we'll set them up with um, either the rehearsal or the broadcast of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir because mm -hmm. the, the Mormon Tabernacle Choir is such a world-renowned um, performing group. Um, and then they're also going to participate in what we call home hospitality. And that's where some of our volunteers will go to the hotel pick up the group or a portion of the group, take them back to their house and feed them a dinner. Um, oh, and it's that's just, so good. Yeah, and it's just this really great way of having an off-the-record conversation of whatever topic they want to talk about and just learn from each other and connect from each other. And that really is the cherry on top of the Sunday of their, the international visitors' experience in America. They really get to see the inside of an American home and what we're really about is being Utahns and about being United States. And, and it doesn't have to be citizens, I don't want to use that word, it really mm -hmm. is people who are living here in the United States. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. That's like one of my dreams, you know, like 
travel the world and eat all the food, you know? That <laughs> sounds like so, so amazing. And I've been even thinking about the idea, like the old, old, you know, biblical times idea of breaking bread uh -huh. and how conversations are had. You invite someone into your home, hospitality, stuff mm -hmm. like that. And that's really great that you guys are continuing, like, just that, like, old human tradition, yeah. um, you know, diplomacy over food. And it doesn't have to be complicated. So an example is last, um, last fall, I invited this group that was here for human trafficking. I don't work in that field, but I was really interested to know about the work that they were doing. So I invited them to my house and I invited my in-laws to come and join us and, and have a meal. And, you know, the food was pretty basic. I think we did barbecue chicken and rice and a salad mm -hmm. and my mother-in-law you know I asked her if she would make dessert and she made sn snickerdoodle cookies mm -hmm. right it didn't have to be anything elaborate and this one woman who was from Belize like flipped out lost it because she was like I've heard of these cookies Aww. and I got so excited to try them and she ate like three of them and she's like can I take a couple back with me to the hotel and we're like take the whole bunch take them to the rest of the group um, so it was as simple as a snickerdoodle cookie to be like, I have experienced America. Mm -hmm. um, and then we just went for a walk around the block and, and showed different aspects of our neighborhood. And they'd never seen an acorn tree before. So mm -hmm. we stopped and we talked about an acorn tree. Um, and it was just really fascinating that things that we take for granted on an everyday life, like an acorn tree and a snickerdoodle, would be so moving and so impactful for our visitors. And mm -hmm. I still stay in contact with those three visitors all the time. We're friends on Facebook. You know, the invitation is out there that if I ever go to their countries, I'm supposed to contact them. Mm -hmm. And so it really is making this very strong, impactful, long-term connection with the world. Wow, wow, that's really beautiful. Yeah. I'm thinking about foods or, you know, things that I've heard about in other countries, and I would die for, like, real Turkish hummus, so right. if I ever go, right. man. Um, so, uh -huh. what were you saying? Oh, I was like, yeah, oh, I yeah. agree. <laughs> Everybody loves hummus. Right. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about some of your programs. Yeah. So, we know you guys, Alliance for Better Utah knows you guys, because yes. you, we've had um, some visitors here with us at Impact Hub downtown, uh -huh. um, and we've kind of spoken with them about what we do. Um, mm -hmm within like our, the transparency and accountability work with government. We've mm -hmm. talked about media and how we int um, interact with the media and what um, American media is like through our eyes mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that. Um, so um, can you talk about your programs? I know you've got the International Visitor Leadership Program, World Affairs Lecture Series, yeah. all those. Can you tell us a little bit about them? Yes, yeah, so our flagship program is the International Visitors Leadership Program. And you know, I just want to recognize the volunteer community because without the volunteer community, we would not be able to do our job. And that is all of the businesses that take time out of their incredibly busy schedules to meet with our visitors and to share their knowledge and expertise. All of our composts, um, you know, we estimate that in a year we have over 500 volunteers donating 8,000 hours. And wow. Yeah, for us, that is almost $200,000. If, if you take that volunteer um, calculation of, of worth, you know, times by the hours, it's almost two hundred thousand dollars. And for a nonprofit, that's four full-time employees. That's mm. huge. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we very much rely on our volunteer community. Um, so we do the the exchange programs, and we're really excited. One of our exchange programs is the Young Leaders of the Americas Initiative, and that's where ten young entrepreneurs that are about twenty-five to thirty-five have established businesses will come to Utah. And um, they and they're from Latin America, so South America, Central America, and the Caribbean, and do a four-week fellowship with a business, um, and and just learn from them and learn what they're doing and connect them with resources. But it is a reciprocal relationship, so the business can have those young entrepreneurs work on a project as they're developing their own business as well. So we're really excited about that. It really is a program where we get a deeply know and learn from the visitors that come to Utah. Um, and then in September, we're gonna kick off our World Affair Lecture Series. It is a lecture series that is open to the public. There's no cost to it. We really feel like access to education and knowledge um, is crucial for what it is we're doing. Um, so they're held up at Westminster College and all of the details can be found on our website, utahdiplomacy.org, but it ranges from um, our first speaker is going to be here for skateboard diplomacy. He's this really cool guy from New Zealand who 
figured out that if he fills his, his suitcases full of skateboards and take them to other countries, that um, he can distribute them and then talk about the relationship between a different country and our country. Wow. So we sort of deemed this this um, word of skateboard diplomacy. So he'll be here and he's going to do a skate demo over at West Valley City Skate Park. So we're really excited about him. Um, we've got a gentleman who's coming in to talk about how ISIS has used social media as a recruitment tool. Um, we have a woman talking about women's rights in terms of uh, Pol uh, national security and political equality. Um, a gentleman who's coming in to talk about diplomacy between Native American tribes and the U.S. government. We've got a uh, former ambassador, uh, Gina Amber Crumbery Wynn Stanley, who's going to talk about being African American and female and being in diplomacy at, uh, in embassies and what does that look like. Um, ocean diplomacy, because there's no, in international water, mm -hmm. anything goes. Mm -hmm. um, and so to talk about that, and then our final speaker is this woman who's going to talk about Muslims for American Progress, and she's bringing this really great photo exhibit that we're going to house at the Salt Lake County Libraries, three of them, um, for about three months. So it really runs the gamut from traditional diplomacy to soft diplomacy. Some topics are fun, a little bit more heavier, um, you know, but it's really a great way to think about how do these global issues have a local impact here mm -hmm. in Utah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've got our lecture series, and then we have just these little pockets of smaller dialogues taking place, like we have a program called Great Decision that's in partnership with um, the Osher Lifelong Learning up at the university. So it's uh, current international topics, um, and the individuals who are retired can participate in that conversation. We have a program issues so you know some of the topics will, will be military conflict immigration you know we picked all the hot topics this year <laughs> religion um, you know uh, diplomacy between sovereign nations uh, you know just so that we can get these uh, these different opinions in a room to talk about mm -hmm. it because we feel like when you express your opinions whether we agree or disagree it's such a great way to challenge value systems and get people thinking about why do they believe a certain way that they do and then we're starting a new youth program called the Young Diplomats of Utah. And that's really full as it's a certification program for 14 to 20 year olds to help with leadership skills, to get them engaged in their community, and then also in, engaged in the cultural aspects that make our community so amazing here in Utah. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's amazing. I wish I was. 14 to 20 years old. I so know, I right? Participate in that. That's so fun. I know. And I like that you're encouraging conversations that sometimes polite society says we're not supposed to talk about with each mm -hmm. other, you know? Um, so, you know, getting that information out, getting your views out, having a conversation, talking through, um, I imagine like talking through, you know, your views on religion, for example. You know, mm -hmm. don't talk about religion at the dinner table. I like that you guys are talking about it. That's great. Right, right. And that's sort of the irony is that it's a brown bag lunch. And so bring your lunch over food. Let's have a conversation. There you go. So food. Food. It's the food. I love it. Right? Oh, nice. We need to have a food diplomacy section. Oh, yeah. That's an idea. I will be there. Okay. We will be there. <laughs> we are always about that food. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to share an experience that I had when um, the, uh, when, uh, the last group that came and joined us mm -hmm. with um, ABU. And it was so interesting because you don't, um, I mean, you know, like you guys sent an email, like this is who's going to be in the group and, yeah. you know, et cetera, et cetera. But then you sit down. And first of all, it was an incredibly humbling experience to sit down with these people who were leaders in their own right, in their own communities and in their own um, organizations in their country. And this is who we are and this is what we do. And I was really surprised by the, you know, because we take on a lot of different issues. And one of the things that we talked about kind of in passing was this inland port mm -hmm. and the inland port authority and that kind of stuff. And that stuck with them. And they wanted to ask us uh -huh. all of these questions about the inland port, which to, you know, to us is kind of like, you know, oh, it's the semantics of, of this and that. But they were, they were super into it. And so it was fun talking with them they had you know an outside perspective and they were so interested in the way the semantics of it worked mm -hmm. it was it was a really fun and enlightening experience and and humbling like i said you know i'm walking in and these are these leaders 
uh-huh. um, that I'm, I get to speak with. It was it was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's so interesting because one of the challenges that we've always faced is, you know, we're really good at figuring out the quantitative data. We know how many visitors, how many days they spend in Utah, and you know, we know how many meetings and who they're meeting with. And one of the things when I started that we were missing was that long-term impact of what does those meetings mean on a global scale. Right. And so we started a program called um, Friends of Utah, and we have been following up for with visitors since a little over a year now. To, and we follow up with them about four or five times a year just to say, hey, we're checking in with you. We want to see what you've been doing since your visit, specifically if anything interesting has happened with your visits from Utah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I, I thought for sure when we started this program that it would be like, oh, Utah was great. I loved it. It was, you know, the best time of my life. Mm-hmm. But what we're getting back are these incredibly rich stories of long-term impact. And so an example is um, in February 2017, we had this group come in for at-risk youth and underserved populations. And one of the, the groups that they met with was Volunteers of America and their youth homeless shelter that they had just opened previously. And this gentleman from Mexico who worked with the homeless population was so inspired by that meeting that he went back to Mexico and within three months opened up a youth homeless shelter in his own community. Wow. Because he he saw how the models worked, he was able to reconnect in with them and uh, you know identify what their resources were, how, how did they get their funding, how did they get the political support. Um, and, you know, and so it was just inspiring to hear that story of just from one simple hour-long meeting with a nonprofit organization that there was this huge impact in this community. And, and we've gotten some really great stories of other things that he's done, like change public policy, implement testing within um, the police department in his community, and, and you know, it's just really inspiring. So you never know when professional resource or gonna, resources are going to say something that is just so inspiring that it's going to trigger one of our volu- or one of our visitors to go back and just change their community for the better. That's so cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, now, recently, and this is kind of a fraught question. Uh-huh. Um, recently, in the past number of years, in the United States and even you know in um, some areas of other countries, we've seen kind of a rise in I don't know if nationalism is the right word mm-hmm. or anti-immigrant rhetoric. Mm-hmm. Um, you know just people kind of closing in, kind of closing off. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm curious if you've seen a reflection of that at all in the work that you're doing, or has it even been impacted? Yeah, you know, so I I understand where that idea is coming from, and I can't speak for the rest of the nation, really, I can only speak to Utah, and I am glad to report that that has not been a reflection in the attitudes and behaviors of our local community. And I think that's why being a native to Utah has made me so proud. You know, it, it come to Utah and see what we're all about because we are a very welcoming community. Um, you know, and there's some reports that have demonstrated that Utah's the most volunteer-driven and philanthropic giving state in the nation, and we've held that record for over a decade. Um, and it just reflects in the behaviors and attitudes of people. The I think in Utah. Um, you know, for this is, we could probably have an entire conversation of why we are like this, but it seems like Utahns are globally curious people mm-hmm. and they just want to meet others and they want to hear stories and they want to live vicariously through others' experiences. Mm-hmm. And with traveling getting so expensive these days, um, the easiest way to do that is to invite somebody from a different country to have a conversation and say, well, tell me about the food you eat, tell me about this custom, um, tell me about this issue that I've heard about because I want to hear it from your own perspective, um, what I should be considering with that particular topic. Um, so in t- as it relates to nationalism, our volunteer base is stronger than ever. Um, we haven't received any kind of negative feedback about our programming that we're doing by bringing international individuals in. Um, and for the most part, it seems like the community really is supportive of these programs that we're doing. 
That's great. That's yeah. so great to hear. I mean, one of the things um, I was I was born in Provo and then I've I've lived around the country and now I'm back. And mm-hmm. one of the things that I'm most proud of about Utah um, is our welcoming of refugees and people yeah. who may be different from our personal experiences. Um, and so that's really great to hear that you're seeing that reflected in your organization. Yeah. Um, so to close, I want to ask you, what can we do? What can I do as an individual and what can I artists do um, on a state and a local level to um, promote better implementation of citizen diplomacy? Yeah. So, you know, as it relates to our organization, the easy things to do is to become a professional resource and meet with our groups, on, you know, to share your professional background with them. Um, hosting a home dinner. Next year, we have this event coming up with um, the Fulbright program that's going to require 45 home hosts in Whoa. one single night. We're calling it the biggest night of citizen diplomacy in Utah. Um, so we're going to be in desperate need of home hosts for this one event in the springtime. Um, attending our events and being part of the conversation, um, you know, and, and even just contacting me to say, I'm really interested in getting engaged with what it is you're doing, how can I do it? I'm happy to come up with some ideas and some um, brainstorming solutions to see how do we possibly expand citizen diplomacy and even the idea of citizen diplomacy. Um, on a larger scale, and it's, it's equally as easy, is contacting the elected officials and saying citizen diplomacy is important to me. Having international visitors come to Utah is, is something that is of value to our state because this exchange of ideas and relationships and best practices really does make for a sustainable economy and a global community. And Utah is very focused on global communication right now um, and, and connection. Um, and, and I have to say that we are very lucky, you know, just sort of reflecting back on that national question again, nationalism question, um, is that even though that seems to be a message out there, what we're seeing from our national and local elected officials is that they are in support of cultural exchange. They are in support of bringing people to Utah. Um, So our legislators and our senators are very supportive of this program. And I think part of it is this unique idea that um, all funding that is given to our program stay in the state of Utah. Mm -hmm. It is the only uh, international exchange program where all of the funding stays in the United state and the, the state based kind of state so yeah so we're really excited about that but letting letting the elected officials know that international exchanges are important it makes us a richer society in terms of cultural understanding great great yeah. so how do people learn more about your organization and get involved um so best way is um you can certainly follow us on social media so we're on facebook twitter instagram um but our website is really key to getting involved so utahdiplomacy.org. Great, great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much yeah, for being thanks. here. Um, and of course, audience, remember, you can find us on Facebook, obviously, Instagram and Twitter, but at Better Utah. And uh, thank you again, Felicia, for joining us yeah, today. Yeah, thank you. Bye, guys.